PTSD. Most people have heard of it, yet few people actually understand just what the condition represents. PTSD is short for post-traumatic stress disorder, and as the name suggests, it stems from the aftermath of traumatic events. PTSD is often associated with war, and while the condition itself isn't strictly tied to war, it does occur in the aftermath of traumatic events, and war can be deeply traumatic, and as a result of this, warfare is responsible for a large number of PTSD cases. We can see this link with war when we consider that the condition first came to light as a result of the Vietnam War. There was a massive rise in mental health concerns among veterans of the Vietnam War, and this made people start to realise that conditions we'd previously referred to as shell shock and battle fatigue and soldier's heart were actually the result of the serious psychological impact of war, and they were not, as we'd previously thought, the result of weak-minded soldiers who simply couldn't cope with war. People were sceptical of PTSD at first. The idea that humans could suffer from psychological injuries was not something we'd had to entertain before. Yet the condition slowly gained awareness and people began to realise that PTSD had always affected soldiers for a long time back into our history. This raised the question, how far back has PTSD affected humans? Has it affected us since our days as cavemen or... If it hadn't, when did we begin to psychologically suffer from war? To answer this, historians have looked back as far as our records go, way back to ancient Greece, to see if the ancient Greeks suffered from PTSD, as we do today. Unfortunately, the question of PTSD in the ancient world cannot be answered with a simple yes or no. It's affected by a number of debates from the cultural applications of PTSD to the very nature of the condition itself. Debates have swayed between claiming the Greeks were immune to PTSD to effectively diagnosing ancient Greeks with the condition. And almost every piece on the topic presents a serious case to be considered. So who is right in this debate? Or whose argument shines through as the strongest? To answer these questions, and to also help navigate these debates, I've asked Dr. Owen Rees to answer some of the key questions on the topic. So... Dr. Rees, do you think that PTSD existed in the ancient world? The question of PTSD in the ancient world is hotly contested. Ultimately, for someone like myself, even though I work on things that talk about it phenomenologically existing, no, the diagnosis of PTSD does not exist at all in the ancient world. Would you be able to say why it couldn't have? There's a couple of strands to it, but ultimately the main point being PTSD is a modern diagnosis based on modern understandings of psychology. Those understandings are still evolving and medicine is not a hard science that can be transferred from culture to culture, time place to time place. So since you said PTSD does not apply to the ancient world, is there a definition we have that we could apply to it? Ah, now, this is where scholarship on this area is getting quite interested. So there are a few models floating about, such as combat stress, which is more of an umbrella term. So it's just kind of the stress and the psychological and physiological impact of war, of combat. Another is what's called moral injury, which is where an individual basically goes against their moral upbringing, their moral understanding of the world, and does something that in essence, they would find immoral outside of that situation. How did the debate on this topic arise? Debate in PTSD starts with a gentleman, Dr. Jonathan Shea, who is a psychiatrist of veteran affairs in the US. He used in his therapies of Vietnam veterans, he used the Homeric epic poem, the Iliad, as part of his therapies. And in turn, he found a lot of veterans associated well with it and he ended up writing a book based on that Achilles in Vietnam in which he talks about his experience of doing this and he talks about how the Iliad reflects some of these experiences and that's the catalyst for it uh, which all other scholarship then gets born from it all comes from Jonathan Shea. So you say that Shea wrote about Achilles suffering with what Shea perceived as combat stress is he right here? Shea's idea that Achilles had combat stress or PTSD is pretty 
categoric about it. No, I do not agree with that. And to be fair to Jonathan Shea, I'm not convinced he would be either. So he spends a long time saying, I'm not saying he had PTSD. I am saying it looks a lot like PTSD. He then goes on to just talk about him having PTSD. So it is confusing for many. But no, I mean, you've got a few issues with Achilles having PTSD. One is he's a fictional character. And the second is he only really fits some of the criteria, not all of them. But ultimately, it's a work of fiction. It's not, you can't easily diagnose a living person two and a half thousand years ago, or three thousand, four thousand years ago for the Iliad. How on earth are you going to do it for a fictional character? Does Achilles showing the symptoms of PTSD show that the Greeks knew about the symptoms and therefore the condition? The question on the symptoms appearing is an interesting one. So yes, Achilles exhibits some of the symptoms we associate with PTSD, um, such as what Jonathan Shea calls berserkerism. So he goes berserk in combat. But ultimately, these individual symptoms are only symptoms of a disorder when you compile them all together. So the fact that a man in war goes to what we consider to be berserk is, is not a symptom of anything other than what psychologists refer to as combat stress reactions. He is reacting to the stress of combat. That does not make a PTSD diagnosis. So some of the symptoms, absolutely, they do exist in the ancient world because they're based on fear. They're based on survival instincts. They're based on the desire for someone not to die, you know, things like this. But no, that these disparate symptoms do not add up to a diagnosis. Was PTSD or combat stress accepted or at least understood in this period? Understood not at all. And there's no evidence at all that PTSD was understood in the ancient world. Roman, Greek, Assyrian, Babylonian, Egyptian, nothing. Nothing at all. What we do have is examples of what appear to us to be combat stress reactions of some sort. And culturally, they're quite well received. A good example of this is the Athenian hoplite Epizelos. Epizelos fought on the front line at the Battle of Marathon against the Persians in 490 BC. We are told that a giant figure of a man with a big beard and a big shield comes up to him, kills the man to his left, possibly someone he knew, passes over him as Epizelos, and then kills continues killing down the line. Epizelos, after seeing this apparition, as he describes it, as a divine being, immediately goes blind, even though no weapon touched him. So modern terminology, you'd define this as almost like a psychosomatic blindness. That's a psychological injury, not a physical one. It's a, it's a psychosomatic injury. So to worse, that kind of aligns with something that could be trauma-based. And what's interesting about his story is that when he goes back to Athens, he becomes a hero. He was one of the great heroes of Athens. Everyone knew his story. Everyone knew of him. They even painted a massive mural to the battle, and he's in it. We're told you could pick him out. And then his story gets kept alive by the Romans in later generations. He's never forgotten. So in that sense, did they know he had anything other than like, what we might have called PTSD, combat trauma? No. To them, this was about a divine epiphany. That's exactly how they understood it. He saw a divine being, and he was punished. In terms of the cultural reaction to him, this is a classic example of actually his diagnosis, his symptoms did not hold him back, but actually made him heroic and someone you wanted to emulate, which is perhaps more interesting. So, as Dr. Risa said, there is no evidence at all that PTSD existed in the ancient world, and thus there's no real question as to whether it did or not. It simply couldn't have. The debate here is centred instead on the existence of combat stresses in the ancient world. This debate is divided into two sides, with one side claiming that human experiences are universal throughout history, and that the soldiers of the past were as human as the soldiers of today, and as a result they would have suffered from the same psychological conditions. The other side of the debate argues that the human experience is relative to the culture and time in which they live, and that the ancient Greeks lived in an ancient Greek society that would have prepared them and effectively immunised them against these combat stress reactions. These sides are referred to as the universalists and relativists, respectively. 
The universalist argument tends to revolve around experiences written about in ancient works, such as those of Achilles and Epizelus. The universalists argue that the existence of symptoms of adverse mental health reactions in ancient Greek writings showed that the Greeks did have adverse mental health reactions to warfare, and that this is proof that they suffered from combat stress. The relativists, most notably Dr. Jason Crowley, argue that the universalist argument doesn't consider the full picture, and that yes, these symptoms might exist in the writings, but this isn't enough proof to suggest that the ancient Greeks did suffer from these conditions. Crowley compares the Athenian hoplite and the American infantryman, and in particular he looks at the psychological environment that the Athenian hoplite operated out of. He claims that since warfare was glorified and normalised in Athenian society, the traumatic nature of it would have been nullified somewhat, and this, when combined with the psychological support structure that the Athenian hoplite operated in, would have effectively immunised the Athenian hoplite against PTSD and combat stress. The universalists and relativists both present compelling points, and it's hard to choose between the arguments. The relativists often fail to address the negative impacts that warfare would have had on the ancient Greeks, and the universalists thus far have failed to present compelling evidence that combat trauma could have existed in ancient Greece. So the debate seems to be in a sort of limbo between the two sides, with neither side really able to gain any ground on the other. So I've asked Dr. Owen Rees back on to see if we can break the limbo and answer the question of combat trauma in the ancient world. So Dr. Rees, your colleague Dr. Jason Crowley has suggested that the ancient Greeks were immunized against combat trauma. Do you agree with this? Dr. Crowley's relativist model is quickly becoming canonical because he's the first to challenge the PTSD model. To do that, he had to go very hard-lined. So he very much says not only does it mean that PTSD couldn't have really existed in the classical Greek world, he literally says that the Athenian hoplite in particular was immune to it, or would have been immune to it. He overstresses the point, I think. What he's done is shown that the social framework of the classical Athenians is so different, we can't just shift this diagnosis and say it's the same, because you ignore all the sociological foundations to a medical diagnosis as a result. That's what he's achieved. What he never proved was that an Athenian hoplite would not be impacted negatively by war in another way. Are there any other examples that could prove the existence of combat stress in this period? The classic examples of combat stress are Epizelos. Another is a guy by the name of Clearchus. Clearchus is a Spartan, but he's so aggressive the Spartans kick him out, which says a lot. He is often aligned with PTSD and combat stress because we are told that he becomes what's called a philopalemos, he becomes a war lover. So whenever he's at peace, he goes and finds war. Whenever he has money, he spends it on war. He never stays still and just goes looking for more war. Which some people, Lawrence Tritel, Jonathan Shea, and the like, the universalists, have aligned with PTSD, because this is something we see in modern veterans, especially with almost like colloquially like an adrenaline junkie, or that kind of addiction to war. It aligns with that. So he's been put up as an example. But other than that, our main evidence that has been put forward are fictional. We've got Achilles in the Iliad, Heracles, who there's a play of his life in which he ends up massacring his family, and this has been aligned with possible PTSD symptoms. We've got Ajax, who committed suicide after being wronged in war. He's been aligned as well. So there are examples people cling to, or people have suggested and put forward, but nothing's categorical, that's at all. What do you think about the debate of PTSD and combat stress in the ancient world? So the debate of PTSD is now in a, a period of flux, but ultimately the work that is coming out at the moment is very much PTSD does not exist in the ancient world. It is too modern. It is too wrapped up in modern society, and modern ideas of the mind and the body. You cannot transplant that into the ancient world. Where the research is now moving towards is that doesn't mean that there isn't a negative repercussion on the human being 
of war that isn't just killing and isn't just dying and maiming, that there is a psychological impact. But we need to understand it through the social terms of the people who are experiencing it and are writing about it. So we've pretty much concluded that PTSD could not have existed in the ancient world as it stands. But as Dr. Reese has explained, we do have examples of combat stress reactions where ancient Greeks have come back from war with what seem to be psychological injuries that we in the modern day would look at and say, that's combat stress. Dr. Reese mentioned a few of these examples, and he also mentioned the scholar that first brought them to light, Jonathan Tritle. Tritle wrote about a few tales of potential trauma victims in ancient Greece, and these were victims by the names of Epizelos, Cleacos, Aristodemos, and Pantites. The first of these victims, Epizelos, who Dr. Reese has already mentioned, was an Athenian warrior whose tale is told by Herodotus as follows. An Athenian, Epizelos, son of Cophagoras, was fighting as a brave man in the battle when he was deprived of his sight, though struck or hit nowhere on his body, and from that time on he spent the rest of his life in blindness. I have heard that he tells this story about his misfortune. He saw opposing him a tall armed man, whose beard overshadowed his shield, but the phantom passed him by and killed the man next to him. I learned by inquiry that this is the story Epizelos tells. In the modern world we look at what happened to Epizelos and we refer to it as a form of combat stress called conversion disorder in which the patient goes blind in reaction to a traumatic event, sometimes referred to as hysterical blindness. Try to use this example to argue that the ancient Greeks did suffer from the same conditions as today and that Epizelos suffering from a post-traumatic stress reaction is proof of the existence of PTSD and combat trauma in ancient Greece. Dr. Reese also mentioned the tale of Cleacus, the man who was too aggressive for Sparta. Cleacus is mentioned in Xenophon's Anabasis, and he was a Spartan commander who was fond of war, and one who sought out wars when at peace. This was a trait that eventually led to him being exiled by Sparta for being too aggressive. Cleacus was later employed by the Persian king Darius as a general, and as a general he got to continue his pursuit of war and his love of war. The author who wrote about him, Xenophon, actually served under Cleacus during his time with Darius. Xenophon eventually wrote, Just as one spends upon a loved one or upon any other pleasure, so he, Cleacus, wanted to spend upon war. Tritle points out that this love for war was alarmingly similar to the love for war seen in many modern veterans, with the phrase hooked on violence often used to describe trauma patients with a love for war. This phrase resonates even more with the tale of Cleacus, when Xenophon describes him as a man who could have lived a life of ease, but preferred a hard one. Also pointing out that Cleacus liked to lead the attack, whose forbidding appearance became happy in times of danger. And this strikes an alarming resemblance to a testimonial from World War I that we now associate with PTSD. In this testimonial, a soldier is described to have loved no man's land and constantly called out there at night. On one occasion, a star shell revealed his tall figure, not lying down but standing erect in the open, whereupon, instead of throwing himself flat, he flung out his arms and he shouted back to the trenches, Tell me if I look like a tree. This is a man who was clearly happy in the face of danger, much like Xenophon tells us of Cleacus. The final two examples Tritle draws attention to were two survivors of the legendary battle of Thermopylae, Pantites and Aristodemos. These two men were both sent away from the battle before it began by the Spartan king Leonidas, and they both, after learning about the death of everyone else who had fought in that battle, eventually killed themselves. Pantites was sent away from the battle on a diplomatic mission to Thessaly, and he missed the battle as a result of this. Upon return to Sparta, Pantites was exonified and cut off from Spartan society, and as a result of this, he decided to kill himself, or so we are told. Herodotus tells us that he felt dishonoured and hung himself, but Tritle points out that there may have been a form of survivor's guilt here. All his friends that he had once fought alongside 
were now dead, and he wasn't. And Trito claims that it could have been this that drove him to suicide. The other Spartan, Aristodemos, was in a similar situation as Pantites. He was sent away before the battle with an eye infection that restricted his sight. Yet Aristodemos wasn't the only Spartan with this eye infection. There was another, by the name of Eurites, who was sent away with the same infection. Yet Eurites chose to return to the battle, and he died as a result. And Eurites doing this led to Aristodemos being labelled as cowardly, since if Eurites had returned to the battle, why didn't Aristodemos? Aristodemos was then exonified and cut off from Spartan society, and much like Pantites, he did not wish to live this life. And so he rushed forth from the lines of the following battle of Plataea, and died in what Herodotus believed to be an act of redeeming bravery. Both Lawrence Trito and Jonathan Shea point out that Herodotus likely left out both of these men felt some guilt over having survived when the rest of the Spartans at Thermopylae had died, and that they killed themselves not as a result of the disgrace that they'd suffered, but instead as a result of the survivor's guilt that they had felt. Crowley disputes this claim of survivor's guilt, and he claims that the lives that these men faced as outcasts would not have been preferable to death, and that it's very likely that these men killed themselves so that they would not have to live these horrible lives, rather than as a result of survivor's guilt. Crowley claims we just simply do not have enough evidence to claim that these men did kill themselves as a result of survivor's guilt. So what Shea and Trito are effectively trying to do here is diagnose Pantites and Aristodemos with survivor's guilt, or at the very least they're suggesting that it's a possibility. But this train of thought is problematic, and as Shea himself said, we should not try to diagnose those in the past with such conditions without looking at the whole picture, and that it's important that we properly address the culture at the time. What we can do, however, is look at the causes and symptoms of PTSD and combat trauma in the modern world, and see if there's any way in which they can be applied to the ancient world. To gain a better understanding of these causes and symptoms, I will be talking to Surgeon Captain Rick Kutsia, a defence consultant advisor in psychiatry in the Royal Navy. So, Dr Kutsia, on a fundamental level, what causes PTSD and combat trauma? Okay, we, we, we don't know. So, well, we, don't, we do know what causes combat trauma. We send people to war and they go into combat. That, and people die and get blown up and all sorts, you know. So we know what causes combat trauma. We don't know for certain what causes PTSD. There are a number of theories. None of them have ever gained supremacy. And none of them has certainly been proven categorically to be correct. The biological theories mostly resolve around memory pathways in the brain and it getting stuck in the more primitive part of the brain, the fear engendering part of the brain, and particularly a part of the brain known as the amygdala. But that biological explanation and the tests that verify it still doesn't give you anything definitive. Psychologically, there is a great number of theories. And all of them have, you know, some elements in it that you can see and some elements that doesn't really explain it. My personal one that I think is the most useful is the Ehlers and Clark hypothesis or model, which basically states that in the person's mind, in their memories, the event isn't over. It is still happening to them. And that's why they keep reliving it and it keeps. So they've moved on in geography, but not in time if you see what I mean. But the short answer is there is no definitive cause for PTSD. And it is likely that there is no one cause, that it's a multifactorial condition. Quite a few people have suggested that PTSD is a monocultural definition and that we can't apply it to other modern cultures, let alone other ancient cultures. Do you agree with this? I think there's a degree of truth in that. We do know that the expressions of mental health distress and symptoms differ across cultures. 
and also the very language that is used to describe mental health symptoms is different, as is the concepts and the understanding. So, for instance, where I come from in South Africa, certainly amongst, you know, without making race an issue, the black community, mental health symptoms are experienced somatically. They will describe to you how they feel physically. You know, my heart is in pain rather than saying, I feel sad, etc. Now, that is a cultural phenomenon. And we also know that cultural phenomena and cultural presentations and means of communicating mental health distress is dynamic over time. So, for instance, let's take a straightforward example. You know, in the 1940s to, say, the 1970s, maybe even the 1980s, Self-harm was relatively limited as a, a psychiatric presentation. There was a great societal rejection of self-harm and suicide based on, on a Christian belief system as being a valid means of communicating distress. And suicide was, in fact, illegal, I believe, till the 60s. And But you saw much more uh, histrionic reactions or dissociative reactions, you know. Whereas now, you know, suicide is very, not suicide itself, but suicidal gestures and, and self-harm is, is exceedingly common. It happens all the time and it's on the rise in the teenagers and, and so forth as a coping strategy. Whereas histrionic reactions you tend to see much less of. Once again, if you move to more third world countries, and I, I don't mean the t- term in any derogatory way, you know, histrionic presentation or somatic presentations is still very common. So even in Western culture and Western industrialized uh, socioeconomic advanced cultures, you can apply the concept of PTSD pretty much across cultures. But as soon as you move away from that, you know, the same cultural application of those norms may not be as precise as they are for us due to those differences are highlighted. Now, if you move that back to the ancient Greece, of course, you know, the cultural appreciation and the language, etc., would have been much different then. So I think it would be exceedingly difficult to transpose the modern concept of PTSD as is onto ancient Greece. What isn't difficult to do is to transpose the concepts of human reactions to overwhelming trauma psychologically to different cultures. And there are indeed, you know, records of even in our own culture, dating back hundreds of years of people describing reactions of trauma that you could understand in terms of modern trauma psychology and in fact PTSD. What issues might we run into when attempting to diagnose ancient Greeks with PTSD? Right, yeah. So first of all, there will be a cultural application issues that we've already discussed so far. But there is also the issue of retrospective bias. So you are looking back in time to a time when these concepts didn't exist and where the recording of them and the preserved history is, is fairly limited from my understanding. There isn't a lot written on this although I haven't specifically looked at it, but it is difficult to, in retrospect, do it. But if we were somehow to have a time machine and we found ourselves in ancient Greece now, and we were put the task, define what is a normal and abnormal reaction to PTSD and what would those symptoms be, it may be that it's not going to look like PTSD at all. It might be that different symptoms and different presentations may predominate, but that you will find evidence of a functionally impairing abnormal behavioral disorder response to certain traumatic events, I think that's pretty much a given that you will find that. Are there any modern psychology definitions that we could look at the ancient Greeks and go, they definitely would have suffered from that? Yeah, no, I think, you know, if there's the one universal one that I think tends to apply, you know, is this concept of, you know, it's the world hysterical reaction, the word has gained a negative association. And, you know, we tend not to use it. So I use it in the historical sense, the best word to use probably is dissociation. But dissociation seems to have been a persistent feature of abnormal responses to trauma throughout the ages, basically, including in in, in modern PTSD and trauma. 
So for instance, I don't know, you know, some some of the people watching your documentary may have seen the, the series Band of Brothers, where the one soldier just went blind without any apparent reason. And that's dissociative blindness, which is a frequently seen amongst the dissociation responses, although dissociation responses of that severity is not common anymore. And I believe you, you found a quote from a warrior in ancient Greece who also just spontaneously went blind. And that certainly has been a persistent feature of trauma uh, as far back as we can remember, or as there is record. So for instance, you will be familiar with the term shell shock, which gained prominence in the First World War. And largely, if you go back and look at the symptoms, although you can see the whispers of PTSD starting to emerge there, it was largely dissociative based. Do you think a warrior society that glorifies or normalises violence could protect the soldier against combat trauma? Partially, yes, but not completely. So, everybody has got their unique vulnerabilities to PTSD, okay? So, for everybody, there may be a potential experience that finds the chink in your psychological armour and can give rise to this idiosyncratic meaning. But we do know that the better people are trained, the better people are prepared, the better their expectations are managed, the more resilient they become to psychological trauma. It's not fail safe and it's definitely not foolproof. You know, it it still happens no matter how good your training is. I don't think that would have, you know, offered a 100% guarantee of no psychological trauma. What we must remember is that the vast majority of people who go to war do not come back with PTSD or develop it subsequently. And, you know, the the estimation of variances vary depending on which groups you look at. But on the whole, it's sort of commensurate with what you would find in a civilian population. So once again, back to a previous answer, you know, certain for modern people, yes, training, realistic training and expectation management is protective. Strong unit cohesion is protective. But in the end, what drives the greatest risk is those three things, type of trauma, the pre-morbid vulnerability, and what idiosyncratic meaning is formed. So as Dr. Kutsia has explained, we don't know what causes PTSD and combat trauma. We simply know that some soldiers go to war and return with psychological injuries. If we do not know what causes PTSD and combat trauma, we cannot look at the warriors of the past and suggest that they did suffer from these conditions if we don't know the causes. Yet, at the same time, as Dr. Kutsia said, everyone has a chink in their psychological armour. Thus, Crowley is wrong to suggest that the Athenian hoplite would have been immune to such psychological injuries. The debate between the relativists and universalists is not one that's easily solved. Both sides have some convincing arguments and make some compelling cases, and as a result, we have to settle somewhere between the two. Both sides are in agreement, however, that PTSD could not have existed in the ancient world. There's a number of issues stemming from PTSD's modern and monocultural definition, yet combat trauma, at least in theory, could have existed in the ancient world. There are a number of examples that show Greeks dealing with trauma in ways which are similar to soldiers of the modern world, from Epizelus and Cleakos to Aristodemos and Pantites. The arguments that tackle these examples fail to address the potential for warfare to have a significant negative impact on a soldier's mental health. So, as Dr. Kutsia said, there's a chink in everyone's psychological armour, and anyone can suffer in the aftermath of traumatic events. Despite Crowley's compelling arguments on the psychological protection that the Greeks would have had, this would not have made them immune to psychological injury. There is little to suggest that the Greeks were psychologically different to modern soldiers on a fundamental level, and as a result of this we can say that, as far as modern psychology is concerned, no one is immune to combat trauma, and that the ancient Greeks could, and likely did, suffer from psychological injuries.